Hello everyone, welcome to Business School 101. An industry is a group of incumbent companies facing more or less the same set of suppliers and buyers. Firms competing in the same industry tend to offer similar products or services to meet specific customer needs. Harvard Business School professor Michael Porter developed a highly influential five forces model to help managers understand the profit potential of different industries and how they can position their respective firms to gain and sustain competitive advantage. Those forces are threat of entry, power of suppliers, power of buyers, threats of substitutes, and rivalry among existing competitors. So let us analyze those five forces individually. Force number one, the threat of entry. The threat of entry describes the risk that potential competitors will enter the industry. Potential new entry depresses industry profit potential in two major ways. First, with the threat of additional capacity coming into an industry, incumbent firms may lower prices to make entry appear less attractive to the potential new competitors, which would in turn reduce the overall industry's profit potential, especially in industries with slow or no overall growth in demand. Second, the threat of entry by additional competitors may force incumbent firms to spend more to satisfy their existing customers. This spending reduces an industry's profit potential, especially if firms can't raise prices. As we know, the more profitable an industry, the more attractive it is for new competitors to enter. However, there are a number of important barriers to entry that raise the cost for potential competitors and reduce the threat of entry. Entry barriers, which are advantageous for incumbent firms, are obstacles that determine how easily a firm can enter an industry. Incumbent firms can benefit from several important sources of entry barriers. Those barriers are economies of scale, network effects, customer switching costs, capital requirements, and advantages independent of size. 1. Economies of scale. Economies of scale are cost advantages that accrue to firms with larger output because they can spread fixed costs over more units, employ technology more efficiently, benefit from a more specialized division of labor, and demand better terms from their suppliers. These factors in turn drive down the cost per unit, allowing large incumbent firms to enjoy a cost advantage over new entrants who cannot muster such scale. 2. Network effects. Network effects describe the positive effect that one user of a product or service has on the value of that product or service for other users. When network effects are present, the value of the product or service increases with the number of users. The threat of potential entry is reduced when network effects are present. Social networks are the clearest example of this. Take LinkedIn, which grew through memberships. As LinkedIn started to get broader adoption, the numbers grew exponentially as the utility of the product became stronger. 3. Customer switching costs. Switching costs are incurred by moving from one supplier to another. Changing vendors may require the buyer to alter product specifications, retrain employees, and modify existing processes. Switching costs are one-time sunk costs, which can be quite significant and a formidable barrier to entry. For example, companies that create unique products that have few substitutes and require significant effort to perfect their use enjoy significant switching costs. Consider Intuit Inc., which offers its customers various bookkeeping software solutions such as TurboTax, QuickBooks, and Mint. Because learning to use Intuit's applications takes significant time, effort, and training costs, fewer users are willing to switch away from Intuit. 4. Capital Requirements Capital requirements describe the price of the entry ticket into a new industry. How much capital is required to compete in this industry and which companies are willing and able to make such investments? Frequently related to economies of scale, capital requirements may encompass investments to set up plants with dedicated machinery, run a production process, and cover startup losses. However, please keep in mind that capital, unlike proprietary technology and industry-specific know-how, is a fungible resource that can be relatively easily acquired in the face of attractive returns. 5. Advantages independent of size. Incumbent firms often possess cost and quality advantages that are independent of size. These advantages can be based on brand loyalty, proprietary technology, 
preferential access to raw materials, and distribution channels, favorable geographic locations, and cumulative learning and experience effects. In addition, incumbent firms often benefit from cumulative learning and experience effects accrued over long periods of time. Attempting to obtain such deep knowledge within a shorter time frame is often costly, if not impossible, which in turn constitutes a formidable barrier to entry. The second force in Porter's model is the power of suppliers. The bargaining power of suppliers captures pressures that industry suppliers can exert on an industry's profit potential. This force reduces a firm's ability to obtain superior performance because powerful suppliers can raise the cost of production by demanding higher prices for their inputs or by reducing their quality of the input factor or service level delivered. To compete effectively, companies generally need a wide variety of inputs into the production process, including raw materials and components, labor, and services. The relative bargaining power of suppliers is high under following scenarios. 1. The supplier's industry is more concentrated than the industry it sells to. 2. Suppliers do not depend heavily on the industry for a large portion of their revenues. 3. Incumbent firms face significant switching costs when changing suppliers. 4. Suppliers offer products that are differentiated. 5. There are no readily available substitutes for the products or services that the suppliers offer. And 6. Suppliers can credibly threaten to forward integrate into the industry. Let's take a closer look at one important supplier group to the airline industry. Boeing and Airbus, the makers of large commercial jets. The reason airframe manufacturers are powerful suppliers to airlines is because their industry is much more concentrated than the industry it sells to. Compared to two airframe suppliers, there are hundreds of commercial airlines around the world. In addition, the airlines face non-trivial switching costs when changing suppliers because pilots and crew would need to be retrained to fly a new type of aircraft maintenance capabilities would need to be expanded, and some routes may need to even be reconfigured due to differences in aircraft range and passenger capacity. Moreover, while some of the aircraft can be used as substitutes, Boeing and Airbus offer differentiated products. Thus, the supplier power of commercial aircraft manufacturers is quite significant. This puts Boeing and Airbus in a strong position to extract profits from the airline industry thus reducing the profit potential of the airline themselves. Force 3. The Power of Buyers The bargaining power of buyers is the flip side of the bargaining power of suppliers. Buyers are the customers of an industry. The power of buyers concerns the pressure an industry's customers can put on the producer's margins in the industry by demanding a lower price or higher product quality. When buyers successfully obtain price discounts, it reduces a firm's revenue. When buyers demand higher quality and more service, it generally raises production costs. The power of buyers is high when there are few buyers and each buyer purchases large quantities relative to the size of a single seller, the industry's products are standardized or undifferentiated commodities, buyers face low or no switching costs, and buyers can credibly threaten to backwardly integrate into the industry. In addition, companies need to be aware of situations when buyers are especially price sensitive. This is the case when 1. The buyer's purchase represents a significant fraction of its cost structure or procurement budget. 2. Buyers earn low profits or are strapped for cash. 3. The quality or cost of the buyer's products and services is not affected much by the quality or cost of their inputs. The retail giant Costco provides a potent example of tremendous buyer power. Costco is not only one of the largest retailers worldwide, but it is also one of the world's Fortune 500 companies. Costco is one of the few large big box global retail chains and frequently purchases large quantities from its suppliers. Costco leverages its buyer power by exerting tremendous pressure on its supplier to lower prices and to increase quality or risk losing access to shelf space at their worldwide stores. Force 4. The Threat of Substitutes Porter's threat of substitutes definition is the availability of a product that the consumer can purchase instead of the industry's product. A substitute product is a product from another industry 
that offer similar benefits to the consumer as the product produced by the firms within the industry. The threat of substitution in an industry affects the competitive environment for the firms in that industry and influences those firms' ability to achieve profitability. The availability of close substitute products can make an industry more competitive and decrease profit potential for the firms in the industry. On the other hand, the lack of close substitute products makes an industry less competitive and increases profit potential for the firms in the industry. Here are some examples of substitutes. For digital cameras, substitutes are smartphones. For traditional brick and mortar stores, substitutes are online shopping websites. For human delivery drivers, substitutes could be advanced, self-driving vehicles in the future. Force 5. Rivalry among existing competitors. Rivalry among existing competitors describes the intensity with which companies within the same industry jockey for market share and profitability. The intensity of rivalry among existing competitors is determined largely by the following four factors. Competitive industry structure, industry growth, strategic commitments, and exit barriers. Factor 1. Competitive industry structure. The competitive industry structure refers to elements and features common to all industries. The structure of an industry is largely captured by the number and size of its competitors, the firm's degree of pricing power, the type of product or service, and the height of entry barriers. The four main competitive industry structures are perfect competition, monopolistic competition, oligopoly, monopoly. Let us discuss these separately. First, perfect competition. A perfect competitive industry is fragmented and has many small firms, a commodity product, ease of entry, and little or no ability for each individual firm to raise its prices. The firms competing in this type of industry are approximately similar in size and resources. Consumers make purchasing decisions solely on price because the commodity product offerings are more or less identical. The resulting performance of the industry shows low profitability. Although perfect competition is a rare industry structure in its pure form, markets for commodities such as natural gas, copper, and iron tend to approach this structure. Second, monopolistic competition. A monopolistically competitive industry has many firms, a differentiated product, some obstacles to entry, and the ability to raise prices for a relatively unique product while retaining customers. The key to understanding this industry structure is that the firms now offer products or services with unique features. The global smartphone industry provides one example of monopolistic competition. Many firms compete in this industry, and even the largest of them, such as Samsung, Apple, Xiaomi, Huawei, or Vivo, have less than 20% market share. Moreover, while products between competitors tend to be similar, they are by no means identical. As a consequence, firms selling a product with unique features tend to have some ability to raise prices. When a firm is able to differentiate its product or service offerings, it carves out a niche in the market in which it has some degree of monopolistic power over pricing. Thus the name monopolistic competition. Firms frequently communicate the degree of product differentiation through advertising. Third, oligopoly. An oligopolistic industry is consolidated with a few large firms, differentiated products, high barriers to entry, and some degree of pricing power. The degree of pricing power depends, just as in monopolistic competition, on the degree of product differentiation. A key feature of an oligopoly is that the competing firms are interdependent. With only a few competitors in the mix, the actions of one firm influence the behaviors of the other. Therefore, each competitor in an oligopoly must consider the strategic actions of the other competitors. This type of industry structure is often analyzed using game theory, which attempts to predict strategic behaviors by assuming that the moves and reactions of competitors can be anticipated. Due to their strategic interdependence, companies in oligopolies have an incentive to coordinate their strategic actions to maximize joint performance. Examples of oligopolies include the soft drink industry, Coca-Cola vs. Pepsi, airframe manufacturing business, 
Boeing versus Airbus, home improvement retailing, the Home Depot versus Lowe's, operating systems for smartphones, Apple iOS and Google Android, and detergents, P&G versus Unilever. Fourth, monopoly. An industry is a monopoly when there is only one firm supplying the market. The firm may offer a unique product, and the challenges to moving into the industry tend to be high. The monopolist has considerable pricing power. As a consequence, firm and thus industry profit tends to be high. A classic example of a monopoly based on resource control is De Beers. De Beers Consolidated Mines were founded in 1888 in South Africa as an amalgamation of a number of individual diamond mining operations. De Beers had a monopoly over the production of diamonds for most of the 20th century, and it used its dominant position to manipulate the international diamond market. It convinced independent producers to join its single-channel monopoly. De Beers also purchased and stockpiled diamonds produced by other manufacturers in order to control prices through supply. The De Beers model changed at the turn of the 21st century, when diamond producers from Russia, Canada, and Australia started to distribute diamonds outside of De Beers' channel. The sale of diamonds also suffered from rising awareness about blood diamonds. De Beers' market share fell from as high as 90% in the 1980s to less than 40% in 2012. The second factor affecting the intensity of rivalry among existing competitors is industry growth. Industry growth directly affects the intensity of rivalry among competitors. In periods of high growth, consumer demand rises and price competition among firms frequently decreases. Because the pie is expanding, rivals are focused on capturing part of that larger pie rather than taking market share and profitability away from one another. In contrast, rivalry among competitors becomes fierce during slow or even negative industry growth. Price discounts, frequent new product releases with minor modifications, intense promotional campaigns, and fast retaliation by rivals are all tactics indicative of an industry with slow or negative growth. Competition is fierce because rivals can gain only at the expense of others. Therefore, companies are focused on taking business away from one another. The third factor affecting the intensity of rivalry among existing competitors is strategic commitments. If firms make strategic commitments to compete in an industry, rivalry among competitors is likely to be more intense. We define strategic commitments as firm actions that are costly, long-term oriented, and difficult to reverse. Strategic commitments to a specific industry can stem from large, fixed-cost requirements, but also from non-economic considerations. For example, Airbus was created by a number of European governments through direct subsidies to provide countervailing power to Boeing. The European Union, in turn, claims that Boeing is subsidized by the U.S. government indirectly via defense contracts. Given these political considerations and large-scale strategic commitments, neither Airbus or Boeing is likely to exit the aircraft manufacturing industry even if industry profit potential falls to zero. The last factor affecting the intensity of rivalry among existing competitors is exit barriers. Barriers to exit are obstacles or impediments that prevent a company from exiting a market in which it is considering cessation of operations or from which it wishes to separate. Typical barriers to exit include highly specialized assets, which may be difficult to sell or relocate, and high exit costs, such as asset write-offs and closure costs. A common barrier to exit can also be the loss of customer goodwill. An industry with low exit barriers is more attractive because it allows underperforming firms to exit more easily. Such exits reduce competitive pressure on the remaining firms because excess capacity is removed. In contrast, an industry with high exit barriers reduces its profit potential because excess capacity still remains. Okay, let's wrap up today's topic. Harvard Business School professor Michael Porter developed the highly influential five forces model to help managers understand the profit potential of different industries and how they can position their respective firms to gain and sustain competitive advantage. These five forces are threat of entry, power of suppliers, 
power of buyers, threat of substitutes, and rivalry among existing firms. Generally, the stronger those forces, the lower the firm's ability to gain and sustain a competitive advantage. Conversely, the weaker those forces, the greater the firm's ability to gain and sustain competitive advantage. Therefore, managers need to craft a strategic position for the company that leverages weak forces into opportunities and mitigates strong forces because they are potential threats to the firm's ability to gain and sustain a competitive advantage. So, what do you think about Porter's Five Forces model? Can you apply this model to an industry you are interested in? Please leave your thoughts in a comment below. If you liked this video, please make sure to give it a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel. Thanks for watching, and I will see you next time.